Good evening, Hopkinton, and welcome to the Hopkinton Hangout Hour. It is Wednesday, and it is 7 o'clock, so we are live. And we have an exciting show for you tonight. In the first half hour, we have Dan Terry, who I believe is the chairman of the Parks and Rec Committee. And in the second half hour, we have some representatives talking about the Hopkinton Emergency Fund. So please stay tuned and um, enjoy our Hopkinton chat. So first off, Dan, welcome to our show. Thanks, Jim. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. It's very exciting. I'll be honest with you. I'm so excited to have you here. We've been looking <laughs> to have Parks and Rec on for a while because you guys do a lot of cool stuff. So um, All right. I'm really excited that you, that you were able to make some time for us. Good, good. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope I can answer a few questions and let some people know about some of the exciting projects we're, we're doing with Parks and Rec. Yes, so we're going to talk about that. Now, first off, let's talk a little bit about you um, and how you came to be um, working with Parks and Rec. Oh, uh, well, I've, I've lived in town all my life, uh, and, and I raised my kids here. So um, for the most part, I guess I was a user of the services. I mean, back when I was in uh, grade school, I even used the summer camp. It wasn't as formal as it is now, but it's now formalize the, the sessions that are, are at the schools during the summer. Uh, it's a real popular program that, that Jay Golfie and the team run. Uh, so I was in, I, early on, I was involved in that. Uh, and as I raised a family here, my kids were involved in just about all the youth sports. Um, and and uh, as they started to get uh, older and uh, even started to age out of some of those programs, I wanted to Kind of give back uh, and and see what I could do to contribute. That's really great. Now, is um, Parks and Rec the the first uh, town organization that you have volunteered on? Yeah, as far as the town committee or board. I mean, I coached in little league and on, on lacrosse teams and and even a little bit of soccer. Uh, even though I didn't know much about that. Uh, so I was in, in, involved a little bit, but this was the first committee and, and my involvement at, at uh, Parks and Rec has, has allowed me to be involved in a ton of different committees through the years. Uh, and and it's, uh, uh, it's provided me with a lot of insight on, on how the towns run. Mm -hmm. How long have you been on the committee, Dan? Wow, I, that should be an easy one, Jim. Um, it's, it's, it, I, I, I'm up for re-election now. I handed in my papers today, as a matter of fact, uh, and I think uh, I've been on. I think uh, I've been on uh, for three three-year stints so far. It might be just two. Oh, okay, that's a goodly amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, so were you were you on the committee during the um, Mike Prate era? No. Um, okay. I, I just at the very, very end of the Mike Preet area, actually, I was, I was, I think I was running for it as, as Mike, um, moved on. And, uh, so I was attending some of the meetings back then, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't get to work with Mike. Okay. Uh, how big is, how big is the committee? So the committee has five members on it. Um, we serve three year terms, uh, and, and, uh, the, the, the Jay Gulfy, our director, is also involved in, in uh, all the meetings we have, and, and he helps us set policy as well. Are all five of you elected by the town in staggered terms? Yep. Yep. There's five with staggered terms. Two, two people are up for re-election, or, or there's two open seats this spring. Okay. All right. So, um, of course, Dan, the obvious question we've been asking everybody is, what happened when the pandemic hit? How did Parks and Rec uh, respond? Uh, I, I th so uh, our office staff would be better at answering that. Okay. But I think they were very, very busy with, uh, with answering questions, refunds. Uh, during the pan in the middle of the pandemic, we moved offices. Uh, we were at, uh, by the Carrigan Little League Park at, at, on Main Street. We moved to... Um, a spot on the, the, the town just purchased on Walcott Street. So that's where the office is now. Um, so the staff of three that are in there, they had to move, they had to deal with questions. Uh, there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, it was, a, it was for everyone. It was a fluid process in terms of what services we were gonna offer for the town. 
that summer, um, what and and how we were going to offer them um, because we we were new with it. And I'll tell you the you know the board of health in town was was incredibly helpful in in providing guidance. As busy as they were uh, with with everything else, they were really helpful in in uh, just just giving us a, a direction to go in. Right, right. So um, now we're hopefully, hopefully on the tail end of this. And as more people get vaccinated and we reach the magic uh, herd immunity, um, you know, it's kind of a race against time against the variants and the vaccine. Um, what, what do you see happening, you know, coming up in the spring and the summer? Is, are you um, starting a lot of programs again or are they still pretty modified? Yeah, I, I think for the most part, as we look into the summer, we, we, you know, where there's the, the major programming at the at the schools for the couple of different age groups, we're we're assuming that we're going to be able to offer those programs kind of business as usual. Uh, we might need to scale back in terms of the the number of of kids that are involved, um, and, and I give a lot of credit to to Jay Gulfi and Colleen Allen and and uh, and Jenny Hart in the office for being so flexible and, and, um, and, 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 you know, hiring's an issue. There's a, there's a ton of issues around that. Um, and, and, uh, we realize that things might be different six weeks from now than they are today. Um, so I, yeah, I'd say business as usual, if possible. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially, I mean, you know, parks and rec, you, you have a lot of people who are huffing and puffing, you know, and, um, uh, working up a sweat and, you know, playing hard out there together. So yep. I'm sure I'm sure that the director's got a lot of um, balancing and uh, protocols to, to get in place with that. Yeah, there's so, a fair amount of coordination with other departments too. Uh, with, yeah. with the school department with, you know, they've got their protocols and, and uh, you know, we don't have our own gyms, uh, uh, but we have one gym that we have pretty regular access to, but, uh, I mean, we need to cooperate with the school and, and, uh, and communicate with them constantly and center schools at other gym that, that, um, while we can schedule it when we want, uh, the condition of the building hasn't allowed us to, um, to use it as, uh, as frequently as we'd like. So you can actually still get into center school and use the gym? Yeah. Parks and Rec has, well, uh, I don't know where it stands today, but we entered, you know, the fall and winter. With an intention of of using that, and uh, you know that's a good example where the, you know when the heating system went out, we we were able to work with the school department and and get their okay to uh, to to shift programs there. Might it's not something they would have signed up for in September, but but I think that there there is some programming that we're able to do I see. through them. Are you, are you having any office space in there, or is anybody in there that you know? At center school, no, and there's no office space okay. in there. So I was going to ask you about the school because I know I've seen how crazy their sports schedule is now. And I'm sure that that has to impact your programs. I was wondering, I know they're, they're trying to like, they're getting all the games done on a day. And um, uh, it, are there any restrictions that you know of that the school is putting on? in during this time or do you find there's more availability how's that working out i'm not uh, jim i'm not sure how the availability's worked out for our, mm -hmm. our programs i mean the major program is kind of is youth basketball um I, I i my sense is and it's changed from week to week or, or month to month um, my sense is that we have reduced and canceled when um the frequency that, that kids were able to participate in those programs when we had to, um, and people overall have been pretty understanding. Yeah, well, that's I'm glad to hear that because you know what, everybody is frustrated. Everybody um, is tired of you know quarantining and social distancing, and uh, as we can see what's happening in Florida, some people are getting very tired of it and are ready <laughs> to go back to life. Yep. Um, so, so tell me a little bit about your role on on the committee and, and how you see what you do. So uh, the, the, the uh, Parks and Rec Commission is like, like we went through this, there's five commissioners involved. We meet, um, well, through the pandemic, just because 
we, we kind of needed to, to react to things. We've met nearly on a weekly basis for the past 12 months. Um, had, and, you know, we've got a new, new commissioner on board and, and that's Lisa Jackson. She kind of had to hit the ground running. And, and uh, I, th I think by the time she was involved for three weeks, she wasn't a new commissioner anymore. Um, our role is really to, to set policy. Um, we, we try to, to set policies that, the, uh, that uh, based on guidance from Jay and his team, uh, the Parks and Rec director and his team on um, how we should manage different assets that we have uh, with Parks and Rec. Um, another big role that we have is to work on um, uh, any capital requests. The last few years, we've had some some major capital requests from CPC, and uh, and and we're proud of some of the progress that we've made we've made there. So um, I, I think the CPC projects are a, are a big focus of of what we've been doing, um, both the requests and manage, managing them going forward, making sure that, that uh, we're making progress towards completing the projects. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't know, um, the CPC stands for? Uh, Com Community Preservation Act funds. It, so, okay. so what that is, is it's a, um, it, it's a portion of our taxes, I believe it's 1%, that, that gets set aside for community-based projects um, there's buckets within, within what gets set aside. Uh, and each year we get a match from the state. It'll vary depending on, um, uh, what, what the state is offering. We're kind of at their mercy, but, but we've gotten a pretty good payback. Uh, I think last year, uh, for every dollar we put in, we got back a uh, 30 cents. So, um, there's a ton of different projects. Park, Parks and Rec, um, has, has certainly had a few, but, um, they can be historical. They can be, uh, open space. There's there's different buckets for them, right? Yeah, and I remember back in the early days when that was first made. Very few towns took advantage of that, so those were kind of like the gravy years. It was the match was really strong um, back then. So, what types of things do you work with the CPC on? Like, what have they? What have you partnered with them to fund and create here? Uh, so over the long term, a, a lot of the improvements we've had to uh, Sandy Beach were, were uh, funded through CPC. Um, some of the projects around Fruit Street were, were done. Uh, the the um, uh, part of the project associated with the Fruit Street fields was funded by CPC. Um, we have uh, the, the building that's now at Fruit Street was funded by CPC. I'm also on CPC, and and uh, I, I I was involved in the uh, the fields behind the high school because those are a community asset, and Parks and Recs helps manage that to make sure that the whole community has access to it, not just the schools. CPC authorized I think 1.7 million towards uh, towards that project, so it it uh, you know re reduced the the bond obligation um, for for for. Uh, the taxpayers over time with with that project. Um, some of the the more current projects that we have going on, um, uh, we are seeking approval at town meeting for a skate park at EMC Park. Uh, that was originally a skate park that was that was set aside there. It's the Hank Fredette Skate Park, and um, it was. Uh, more or less developed by students and students made the investments and built it up. But over time, it's, it's become unsafe. Uh, we've actually dismantled part of it and we've gone out to get a, more of a professionally designed and professionally installed skate park that'll go on there. That, that was a, if I can, that was just a really interesting process. Yeah. Um, and, and even I, as, as the application came into CPC and the dollar amounts were relatively large. I, I think it's three hundred and fifty thousand dollars with, with um, uh, some water abatement and with the design piece of it. I, and I think people were thinking that that there wouldn't be many people that were interested. Well, um, Jenny Hart from the Parks and Rec office kind of knew some people that that wanted to be proponents. They showed up at CPC. They made a phenomenal pitch. There were. 13 year old girls doing the pitch, 45 year old men doing, doing the pitch, just talking about what, a, what an asset it would be for the community. And by the time that whole process took place, the members of CPC were coming back to Parks and Rec saying, 
you, you're going to have a, you know, t t just you're going to have a, a, a proposal on this, right? We're, we're going to move forward with the skate park. So <laughs> it, it really swayed people. It was a, it was a, uh, I think it was a, it was a effective process, but it was a right kind of process that we should have. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great story because it came about because some residents wanted to see it and now it was, it's proven and it's going to be, you know, more professional and safely constructed and it'll have some ongoing oversight to keep it that way in the future. It sounds like a great idea. Yeah, we have, I mean, we, we do a great job in this town with the, with the major sports and, and, uh, uh, you know, there's plenty of opportunity to play soccer and lacrosse and baseball and softball and, 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 and all that. But if, but if you're, uh, someone that, that isn't necessarily interested in those organized sports and team sports and showing up at a particular time, but you want to get outside and, and, and challenge yourself to, to, to do something or, 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 or um, just have some level of recreation and that's one you choose. It's, uh, we're happy to be providing that opportunity. So let's say that that comes to pass. What's Parks and Rec's role once it gets constructed and, and ongoing? How do you, do you manage that property? Do you oversee it and repair? How does that, what do you, what do you do? We'll need to, we'll need to manage it, maintain it, uh, 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 or, or uh, we won't, we don't have a staff to physically maintain it. But uh, if it's maintenance that is required that the DPW could do, uh, the way we, we're set up to work with them is uh, that they would they would do that work. If it were something that were larger scale and we needed to budget for it, then we're, we'd work um, as a commission. We'd work to to, to have a, a request in the budget to to do that. But um, the the office would oversee those changes. Um, I guess the other side of it is as as time goes on and as there's a need for rules, we 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 can help. Um, uh, make sure the rules are in place. Um, so do you envision that like parks and like may schedule opportunity, you know, may schedule like lessons or have open skate times or, or stuff like that? Like, do, do you get involved at that level of detail? Jim, we haven't talked about that, but that's a great yeah. idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that, that that's uh it, it's yeah that's that's a that's a good idea to uh to, to help introduce more people to the sport and and let them utilize it uh that that is the type of thing that that people come to us make a request uh, yeah. we're getting requests for for uh something different now that i'd like to talk about that that uh uh we'll need to invest in and, and move forward with Okay. Well, I, I had a couple of general questions, but please go right ahead. What do you, what well, are you that is, um, we, it, it, it's, it's pickleball. We, we, uh, there's, I don't know if you know anything about pickleball. I've never played, but, uh, it, it we have had a lot of requests to, um, provide uh, pickleball courts to the town. It's kind of hard to do at the tennis courts because we'd need to reline them in the school. You, you know, it's a tri-valley league sport and, uh, they don't want to change the lines on those courts. We don't think we haven't had a conversation with anyone about it, but, but we think, and this would be another CPC request in the, in the fall. Uh, we, we think that there's a, a huge uh, benefit to having pickleball courts in town. I, I think it, uh, the, the, a lot of what we do in parks and rec, we, we it, and, and maybe in the town in general is, is, that 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 fifty year old crowd that that has kids that have have graduated from school that we we might not have any specific offerings for them and and uh, this might fit the bill. I, in, in the last two months, we've had uh, a couple of people come to the Parks and Rec meeting to to make a request that we that we start to solve this problem that you can't play pickleball in Hopkinton. And mm -hmm. uh, I've I've fielded a few emails directly from from uh, friends on that and uh, people that I've run to run into have, have made the all independently. So I think this might be another, uh, uh, you know, uh, grassroots movement to, uh, to, to invest in, in that. So uh, that's probably a, a request we will discuss and, and propose to CPC in the fall. Wow. That's really something. Um, it's just like really cool that it's so organic, you know, and it's coming from the community. Now, when you look at something like that, how do you say there's a lot of uh, pickleball interest or there's, there are two people that really want to play pickleball? 
you know, how do you how do you gauge the scope of the interest in town? I I, I think I it, it is organic. Uh, it, it is it, it is um, you know, uh, and I think that's why. Well, I think it's important that those of us that are Parks and Rec commissioners are, are um, I guess, available in the community and 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 willing and interested to have conversations and hear people's ideas and and it, it's uh, no formal survey has taken place but it's it's just uh you just kind of get a feel for a sentiment from the town mm. on that type of thing yeah so now so now i'm wondering it's so interesting now you'll have a skate park maybe you'll have a pickleball court how and how many facilities are you engaged with that? And I assume you don't have any kind of staff other than DPW to help maintain those. Um, so, so how many, how many, like other than school properties, which are maintained by the school, uh, like roughly, do you have uh, a bunch of other locations and other um, uh, programs in the town? Well, yeah, I mean, Fruit Street is there. Sandy Beach is, is Sandy Beach is probably one of the more labor intensive ones because mm -hmm. you now there's safety issues there. There's there's certainly maintenance issues um, and 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 just cleaning up uh, on a on a daily basis. That gets a lot of certainly a lot of traffic during the during the hot weather. So uh, yeah, we, there are a, a number of places that we manage. A lot of them um, end mm -hmm. up being man being some of the work gets done through the partnerships we have in town. Fruit Street, we've got, you know, the, the obvious partners in Hopkins Youth Soccer and Lacrosse and 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 uh, groups like that 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 use the use it and they end up being good partners. So the the level of maintenance isn't isn't that high um, on those. Uh, but yeah, you're right. We need to we, we do have a, a good relationship with the folks at DPW um, and and uh, they have taken on more responsibility uh, this year towards maintaining those those places. So is that it? Is that like people who are using facilities, policing and cleaning up after themselves and then DPW helping out and, and that's how you maintain all these things? Yeah, more or less. Um, wow. I, I mean, sometimes we, we, we need to throw a little bit of labor and elbow grease at it and, and uh, you know, we do have resources that we can we can hire to get out and do things. We so, sometimes that that uh, you know, that Fruit Street might get a little a little bit uh, it might be a little bit more trash blown around th than hits the trash barrel, or the trash barrel fills up and blows around. And we need to get someone out there to to, to keep it in great shape. Mm -hmm. And do you have uh, as a commission of the town? Do you have a budget? Yeah, uh, so our, our budget kind of is done in uh, in a, in a, a couple of different ways, uh, uh, and and this is this is news, uh, or this is this is a new way of doing it as of this past fall. Okay, um, we, we've got a budget that kind of covers our staff, and that's th those are you know we don't have like revenue associated with the staff in the office, so that's a that's one type of budget that we have. We have a budget for our programs where we fully expect our programs uh, to, uh, to, to the, the, the revenue to meet the expenses. So they pay for themselves. And then we, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, then, and then we've got things that don't produce revenue or can't cover their costs. Sandy Beach is an example of that. Uh, we, we, can't have, we can't service debt associated with Sandy Beach and uh, for, for the, for the uh, uh, rehab that we did probably 10 years ago. Um, and have lifeguards and staff there to make sure people are paid to go in and uh, clean up the place and, and and all that. We can't charge enough of the residents to 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 level fund that. So there's a contribution from the town for that. Um, the, the the and then the so so the the other part of the budget is that um, DPW is in the past we used to ask them to do work with 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 transfer costs and do things like that now now we have a specific set of duties that the dpw signs up for and staffs for and budgets for every year uh, and that's to do things like um, 
um, empty trash at, at Fruit Street, empty trash at uh, uh, Sandy Beach, uh, keep the common in great shape like they do, those type of things. We don't really see revenue at the common, but we, but we do see that. Other things that come out of that kind of um, non-revenue bucket, if you will, that, that, that we ask for kind of a town subsidy budget-wise to handle, um, the, the concerts that we have on the common, uh, that, that, that costs a few bucks every year, uh, the movies we have on the common, those types of things. Um, um, actually, next year, we, we, we intend to have in the budget uh, the skating rink that we've done from uh, on, on some years, uh, uh, but we're going to try to do the skating, skating uh, rink again next year. Hmm. Now, you mentioned your staff. How big is the staff? The staff is Jay Gulfy, who is the Parks and Rec director, uh, and Colleen Allen and Jenny Hart. And Colleen and Jenny work... Um, uh, they, they don't work um, a full 40 hours a week. Okay. Hmm. Now, but they're it, busy as can be. I'm sure. I'm sure. Especially in the upcoming months where everybody wants to be outside. Uh, you said that the, um, the common's not really revenue generating. If somebody wanted to use the common, like, oh, poly arts, or when there's a rally on the common, it, like, do they apply to you for a permit to use it? Great question. So our stance as a Parks and Rec Commission is the common should really be there for the benefit that anyone that wants to show up and, and take advantage of it. And we'd prefer not to schedule anyone using it. So mm -hmm. more often, I mean, we, we do see certain permits uh, and, the, and the certain partnerships that we have. The, uh, the, the farmer's market on Sundays is something that we think we, we get a lot of great feedback from the town that they like having it there and they take up that quarter and, and uh, they, they do it. They don't, we, we look at their finances every year. They don't make a lot of money. Uh, we do charge them a couple bucks for it, but uh, it really does. It, it would be a drop in the bucket compared to what it costs to maintain the, the whole common. Um, uh, Poly Arts is another one. They, they unfortunately couldn't, couldn't have their, uh, uh, their event last year, but they're on pace to do it this year. Yeah. They, they do pay us a, a, a fee to use the common but again it's a drop in the bucket rel relative to what it takes to to keep that grass green and and uh the fountain beautiful right now we got about two minutes left so i'm just giving you a two minute warning uh in case there was something that you have going on or coming up that you would like to make sure you got a chance to mention before i take up all our time yep one so the one other cpc project again is uh is the uh dog park uh, a lot of people are interested in that. That's going to be at Fruit Street. We got some CPC funding for that, but we also got a large grant, $250,000 from the Stanton Foundation. It's a, it's a group that uh, that's what they do is they fund dog parks throughout the state. Some uh, benefactor left a lot of money to, to, to go and do that. Um, so that's, that's uh, the, the one other major project. And, and that's really on pace to be completed sometime this spring. Nice. So it's already... It is going to happen. Doesn't have to go to town meeting to be approved. We, I, 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 I believe they were meeting this week to approve the contract. Okay. For the for the for the build out. Wow, fantastic! All right, so Dan, that was our half hour. Make sure you tell your director it's quick and easy and a lot of fun. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. I was appreciate all that you do. I always say this to people, you know, for making Hawkington a great place to live. And you're one of the people that really kind of adds to the livability um, and the, the fun uh, that we have at our fingertips. So I appreciate that the work that you and your commission does. Well, that's very, very kind. I, I, uh, I, I enjoy my involvement there. Uh, I, I can't think of another place in town where I'd rather, rather spend my time. When, I know, I know Mike Craig get dragged out of kicking and screaming. He, he really loved it. He really loved that too. <laughs> All right. You have a great night and I'll hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So that's very interesting. And I encourage everybody to find the Parks and Rec on the town website and see where you can get involved and, and have fun in our community. And now continuing the community conversation, we have uh, some people coming on that are going to be talking about the Hopkinton Emergency Fund. So we have um, Zach, Hannah, and Don. Thank you all so much for being here. And I would like to start, if you wouldn't mind, just introducing yourselves and telling us you know, who you are and where you came from. 
It was not with Zach. How about that? We'll make it easy. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, thanks for having us on. Um, so I'm Zach Sasitsky. I graduated Hopkinton in 2018. Um, and I'm now a junior at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. All right, now wait a second, wait a second. Uh, Zach, what are you studying? I'm studying finance and data analytics. Oh, that's a great school. It's a great school. I took my kid to Washington. We walked by there. It was beautiful. All right, Hannah, say hello. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Hannah Kruger. I graduated from Hopkinton in 2012, um, and I'm currently a teacher at a school for kids with autism and other developmental disabilities. Fantastic. And we know Dawn. Dawn, say hello. Hello, I'm Dawn. I'm the Director of Youth and Family Services. Welcome. To, all right, so glad that you're all here. Now, let's, let's start with the definition, because I don't know if everybody has heard of this, although it's extremely uh, exciting. Um, what are we talking about tonight? So um, we're talking about the Hopkinton Emergency Fund, which is a new nonprofit in town. Um, and the mission is to provide temporary financial assistance to residents of Hopkinton um, through collaboration with local human service organizations, um, such as the wonderful Hopkinton Youth and Family Services. Um, and we're lucky to have Don joining us tonight. <laughs> All right, where did this idea come from? Yeah, so um, when I came home from school in March due to COVID, um, I was fortunate enough that Zoom University isn't as vigorous as um, <laughs> in-person classes. And so um, I was connected to Don through my mom um, and Dawn had expressed that this was a need um, in Hopkinton that she saw. Um, and really, they just needed someone to get it off the ground running. Um, and so, again, I had some extra time. I was looking for a way to get back to Hopkinton. Um, and so I um, talked with Dawn and a few others to kind of understand the need um, and then started reaching out to people and one of the first people that came to mind was Hannah, um, who I knew through our parents co-directed Timlin Race together. So I knew um, that she was very involved in philanthropy um, and it was kind of a perfect fit for the two of us to um, get this thing off the ground. Okay, um, so, so Hannah, give me a little detail about how you got, how you got connected and what drew you to this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so similar to Zach, um, I, you know, kind of grew up with uh, parents who were heavily involved in volunteering and kind of just fell into that as well. Um, and same thing, it's just um, this past year has been really challenging for a lot of people. Um, and we've really seen firsthand the different ways that people have struggled and not knowing how to help, but really wanting to. Um, and then when Zach came to me with this idea, it was just kind of the perfect storm where I was trying to figure out the best way to help as many people as possible. And this kind of just fit right into that mold. Um, unfortunately, I don't have quite as much time as I would like to. Um, I just finished up my master's. So now I have a little more time, but um, yeah, definitely um, trying to make everything fit. And it just, it all worked out really well. That's great. Uh, Dawn, I'd like to turn to you for a minute because you know what, when you think of Hopkinton and the things that we're famous for and all the wonderful things that we have in this town, this type of need typically is not front of mind. And some people may actually say, I can't imagine that being a need in Hopkinton. Could you, could you give us some information about that? Sure, yeah, it, suburban poverty is really hidden, right? Like it's, um, it can be, really easy to not be seen when you're going through a financial struggle or when you know you can't put food on the table and it's not something people talk about and 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 you know not that it's a shameful thing but people carry shame and and so it stays really quiet long before covid um long before it was even a whisper or we knew a pandemic was coming we were wrestling with this problem and we um and when i say we um colleen souza who's the other social worker in the department and amy who is the um, senior center director we had been talking and meeting um 
with um, Colleen from St. Vincent de Paul. And we had been talking, um, our staffs had been talking about um, doing articles around suburban poverty. So, you know, COVID, like so many other things, shined a light on a lot of things going on in society that um, are troublesome and that hurt people. And economic inequity is one of those things. And so most of the families that we serve that are struggling are working families, but not earning a fair wage. And so, um, you know, not able to pay for all the things that, um, you know, they need to, to stay afloat when rents are like bigger than mortgages sometimes, you know, when, uh, when, you know, public assistance programs will say, yes, you can get help from us, but your car can't be valued at more than $2,000. Now, who set that archaic amount and when, <laughs> you yeah. know, and so if you're driving that, you're driving a beater, that's probably going to break down, and then you don't have money to fix it, and then if you use your rent money to fix it, you can see the dominoes starting to fall, and that cascade happens, and um, so we saw people right on the edge of losing everything, their home, um, their livelihood, their jobs, you know, um, and the safety net for their family, like over one thing happening, like, you know, a muffler blowing on a car or the, you know, whatever happens to a car that doesn't make it run, probably not the muffler, but, you know, it <laughs> shows my technical capacity. But, you know, those things that, you know, can happen that cost a lot to repair and, you um, you know, so that's where we landed. That's, um, and, and I think it came through, like Zach was saying, a conversation I was having with his mom and saying like, oh, you know, I wish we could start some sort of emergency fund in town. You know, I wish there were residents that could had the spirit to get this going. And then she's like, I'll get back to you or somebody will. And then Zach called me, <laughs> he reached out via email first and we had a conversation and he's like, I'm looking for something to do you know, to give back to the community. And it was just perfect. Um, and we looped Amy back in and Colleen in and, and Amy's staff, and we all had conversations, multiple, and then they started the hard work of finding other people to help them do this. Mm. Wow. All right. Uh, Zach, what is the solution? What, what is this? How, what is this fund? How does it operate? Yeah, so essentially, I think the easiest way to think about it is kind of a, as a financial backstop to some of the organizations we have in town. Um, so all of the organizations are unique and, you know, what they can do and what they help with, you know, Project Just Because, Youth and Family Services, the Senior Center, um, St. Vincent to Paul. Um, but oftentimes, um, either the need is out of their scope or they just don't have the financial capability to, to help their client. Um, and so that's where we come in. Um, it's a confidential referral process that's led by the referral organization, such as Hoffington Youth and Family Services. Um, and essentially, if there's a need that can't be met by the referral organization, either individually or in partnership um, among the referrals, um, they will come to us, explain the need, without identifying the individual. Um, and then our grant committee will um, approve of the funding and give the funds directly to the business vendor. Um, and so that way we ensure that the funds go to the right place. And we also ensure that, um, you know, there's no um, identity information revealed about the person in need. And that, that's one of the biggest parts of, of how the process works. Okay. So, um, Hannah, do you know about, because you know what, I've, I've recognized those names, but I didn't recognize St. Vincent de Paul. Can, can you tell me a little bit about what, what they do? Um, yeah, so St. Vincent de Paul is another human service organization in town, um, and they are associated with um, some of the churches, and um, they have similar capabilities to um, the project just because um, where their financial support abilities are a little bit more limited, um, and that's kind of where we really wanted to fill in those gaps. Um, so again, able to to serve the community um, in certain ways, um, but the financial piece is really kind of where all of the current existing human service organizations um, are unable to meet some of those needs. Okay, great. Now, everybody knows Project Just Because, and everybody knows um, the Youth and Family Services. 
and now everybody knows uh, St. Vincent de Paul. So, and uh, Zach had mentioned this is your group is kind of a, a backstop. So to anybody, um, is this, does this provide for anything that the other groups don't? Or do all the other groups really have the capability to support the needs that, that people have, but just not the resources to match the needs? Or do you do something different? So the way it, it sort of works is that clients that we know of, so people who come to us um, and, and we'd like it to go through, I, I think it has to go through a human service organization, am I right? Like folks don't go directly to you, but they come through a human service organization because our heads are working, we're social workers and our heads are working about like, okay, so you need help with rent. But we know that, you know, there might be other needs like utility support. So fuel assistance might be something we help them sign up for. We might recognize that there is a food issue that would be helpful that would free up funds to pay something else. Or, you know, um, in my previous job, we had an emergency fund like the one that, that's getting started now. And a mom just reached out that she needed $35 to pay for her kid's school picture because she didn't want her kid to go without. And every time I mention that, like I get totally choked up and I was like, is there anything else that you need? And she's like, I'm managing, but this $35, I don't have it. I, there's no, no way I can get it. And so like right away I could turn to the fund and they could do that. And that's a small amount. And and, you know, like for small amounts like that, St. Vincent de Paul has helped us and they've helped us in some larger ways, but we, we then drain their capacity really quickly when we ask for big things. And so what the fund enables us to do as human service providers is extend that reach so that you really can get like some legs under a situation that you're not constantly throwing something at a problem and, and hoping something sticks but that you can really get wrap around a family or wrap around an individual and, and help them for a while so that, you know, like, and it might be that one time only need that they come to the fund for, for some rental assistance, but we're helping in other ways through these other organizations. And then they're back on their feet and they don't need to turn back to us again because they, we got them through that crisis point in their life. I think that's really, really powerful. And I think that a lot of times, you know, people may think, oh, it's just, it's huge. You know, the problem, I mean, everything is so expensive in today's world and, and how can we do that? But your story of the $35 um, photograph package for the student is so much more than pictures. Kids who can't, you know, understand why they're not getting a picture you know, and they're, they're feeling different and other, um, to be able to just have like this normal piece and it's $35, you know, um, this is like the kind of stuff where I think, uh, community and compassion, you know, can kind of like come together and, make a world of difference to people who really, you know, who really need it. So where, where does this money come from that you've given away? Go you ahead, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we actually just started an initial fundraising push to the general public. Um, so we've, we've been hitting Facebook hard. Um, we have a great team, um, a fundraising committee, but also everyone on our board has um, put in a lot of effort to hang up flyers and go to businesses in town. Um, so our initial fundraising push, we're trying to get money from the public. Um, our goal is to raise in this initial push somewhere between 10 and 20,000. Um, as of right now, I believe we're at about 7,000 in the first week. So it's been a really good um, initial push and we're hoping to finish strong here in the next uh, week, week and a half, um, hopefully to double that number. 
Yeah, Jim, and like you said, um, so our goal is really to create this Hopkinton-based community support group. Um, and so, you know, we're very fortunate to live in this wonderful town that has all of these wonderful organizations that can assist people. And and I think by by realizing that the the money that you're donating to us is going directly to your neighbor who, you know, as we talked about earlier, as Dawn said, it's, um, you know, it's definitely a hidden uh, a financial burden that you'll see in the suburban poverty. And so to be able to support your neighbor without even really knowing you're doing it, but knowing your money is going to someone close to you and just really helping to establish that strong sense of community that Hopkinton already has, but just to continue to build upon that, I think is really special. Yes, well said. So Don, I'm just wondering um, if you can, in generalities, talk a little bit about some of, in your time here, some of the needs, some of the types of examples that you have seen in our community of Hopkinton. So people can try to, you know, imagine what, what, what is needed. Sure. It's, it, it can be grandparents raising grandkids that, you know, and they weren't anticipating at their stage in life that that was going to happen. And so they're already living on a fixed income, and then, you know, there are other needs all of a sudden, and, and it's expensive to raise kids, you know, and, and so um, things come up and, you know, like in, in their older years, maybe they're sick too. We've had situations where both the mom and the dad become ill in families um, at the same time. And so there's like one job loss and another one on leave, and they're trying to hold it all together. Um, there are situations like I referenced earlier where um, you know, it's a working family and the car breaks down. Or um, another thing that really impoverishes families is divorce. And it usually impoverishes women and children. And so, um, you know, the earning capacity of the, the mom isn't as great because she's also responsible for the kids and trying to, you know, manage the childcare costs and get the kids to school and figure out her own job schedule. And, and then some employers aren't understanding around that. And so there can be a job loss there or just the need for a little extra because just trying to hold it all together, you know, and in that one month you can't make the rent or the summer camp issue has just pushed you over the edge because you don't have summer care for the kids. A lot of people in suburban communities today don't have family around. And you know their family is across the country. And so you know folks are more isolated. And you know, I'm saying this during COVID, but you know, even like without COVID in the way, you know, folks are isolated. And um, to be able to, you know, have somebody, you know, sweep in and watch your kids for a week just doesn't happen. And and so for a lot of families. And um, you know, those are some examples, you know, I don't know if they're as rich as what you might like, but you know, like we're really, I'm really being cautious about, you know, protecting families confidentiality, but right. um, so it's medical costs. It can be sometimes the, the cost of something medical that's not covered by insurance. What we see oftentimes is folks are underinsured. So they may have health insurance, but their co-pays, if you have somebody with a condition that requires multiple doctor appointments, and then you have like $40 in copay, but it's like five appointments a week, like right there, you're like, you know, how do you do that? If, if you are, you know, just basically on a basic income, it's really tough to do. And then you add to that the cost of medications and copays for that. And things just start to mushroom and then credit cards run out, like credit cards get maxed and they get shut off. And that's what we see people getting into trouble. It's, it's these sort of usual expenses that if you're on that line, they're not so usual, they're really scary and they mount up very quickly. Now, that's one thing I was going to say, and I am not saying this um, to be uh, negative, but I'm saying I'm, I'm going to be asking this because I'm interested in how you respond to this. When I think about when something goes wrong, okay? If my car needs repair, that's $1,500. If I don't have money for rent, I don't know, it's gonna be at least $1,000, right? Um, the co-pays, I can understand, but it seems like life is so expensive and those bills, as you just said, can mount so fast. 
like what can you know what when i say we i'm talking to the gentleman like what can we do it just seems like it gets overwhelming uh very quickly so what's you know like what can we do i mean your original goal is 10 to twenty thousand dollars i mean if you know 10 people have their car breakdown that's a significant portion of your first goal right so what do you do to be motivated and to express that to those of us who are just in the community that are looking to, that should be looking to support you the one of our biggest hurdles so far um, has been the fact that the fund really hasn't launched for use yet. So I think um, once we are able to start accepting referrals and see the need, um, that data will be very helpful um, to disseminate that to the public. And I think that's how we'll keep the momentum going in terms of raising funds. Um, so I think in terms of timeline, we're hoping to you know, launch the fund for use by our referral organizations you know, as soon as next month. Um, and, you know, I think that will be really helpful. We'll get more data um, and we'll start to really see the need and that will translate hopefully into momentum um, for people to keep up the, the donations. That's really good. You know, uh, Don, I was thinking about when you said that I, and, um, you know, Chevrolet Land's always having the same thing. It, the biggest problem is you really can't transmit the needs that you're seeing because of confidentiality. And, you know, uh, we, there's a whole argument, not an argument, but like a whole sadness of how there should be no shame when, you know, hard times hit us all. Everybody's human, everybody goes through struggles. And it's just, you know, to have, to have shame on yourself on top of that is just really sad um, that they have to deal with both of those things. And so it must make it like it must be very hard to try to express to people, look, give because we're doing these, but we can't tell you, you know, what we're doing. Well, we can share the scenarios like we did. And then also yeah. remember, we're not doing this in a vacuum. Like we still have St. Vincent de Paul that can help with some needs. So, you know, that initial fundraising push will help some you know, and it will hit some of those, those larger needs when they come. And so, you know, we're still doing this in partnership, you know, like I really view this as a really important structural piece to the safety net. Um, and it's, it's going to be a very important tool in helping families um, that we didn't have access to before. Um, and, and um, you know, and yet it doesn't diminish any of the other organizations that are helping us you know, help families and they each have their role in their place. I think the beauty of this fund is that folks can come confidentially. Like they just have to tell us, right? And then we can keep it quiet. And, and so it's like, you know, um, we, we would say something like, you know, um, single parent um, with three children, you know, car broke down, can't get to their job and you know they're they're nervous about the rent you know payment and they would have to use their rent money to fix the car you know without this amount and they think they can cover this much but they're asking for this much and you know and so we never have to give that information we we tell who's fixing the car that that check gets written out to the place that's fixing the car the check gets brought to us and we get the check to them so that there's, you know, so we make sure it goes to the right car. <laughs> then, you know, then that way it's it's kept secret, it's kept quiet. Um, and and folks don't have to lose their dignity in the midst of, you know, everything else that they're going through. Right. All right. So our, our time is beginning to grow short. I do want to give you some time, but I have a couple of quick things. Number one, are you a 501c? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. And Zach, you had talked about this initial fundraising thing. You talked about going to businesses and having flyers. Is this an outreach that you're doing for businesses or are you also outreaching to uh, the public? Yeah, it's definitely both. And I think this one is definitely more aimed at the public. Um, you know, we're hoping to really just generate um like I said, momentum and really just make people aware that this exists, I think is the, the biggest thing in this initial push. 
And um, just as an aside, just out of curiosity, are you doing subscriptions like, you know, GVH does? Yeah, we actually just discussed that at our meeting last night. I think um, one of the biggest challenges too has been, you know, we're like a startup business. We have to make decisions about, you know, what software we want to invest in, you know, what, um, you know, where we want to spend our time and effort um, and, you know, questions like you just posed. So um, that's still up in the air as of right now. Okay. All right. I'm saving your contact information for last because I want people to just be, you know, writing that down at the very end. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Is there something that I should have asked, something that you would like to um, mention or get out there as, you know, uh, a goal or, you know, uh, how many people are on your board and anything like that from details? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the the biggest points um, that I want to make sure that everybody is aware of is that we are really in collaboration with the existing human, human service organizations in town. And we're extremely grateful for that relationship that we have with all of them. Um, and our board, we have a board of eight, um, very strong board um, uh, for our organization. And um, it's just been a fabulous experience for, for both of us. Um, we're learning a lot from everybody that we're working with. Um, so it's been really fantastic. Um, and just, yeah, just to continue to support the needs of our neighbors in town. Now, not to put anybody in the spot, but does anybody know the eight board members' names? Just, I'm out of curious. Yeah, I can, I can shout them out. All right. <laughs> Uh, so we have um, Smitha Ram, who's been a fantastic marketing director leading our website. Um, our grant committee is Junith, Judith Weinthaler and Renee Dean. Um, so they've been super helpful so far, and they're going to have a core role once the fund launches. Um, Jay Cheney has been an awesome um, member of the team. He just won us a big donation today, and he also is involved with St. Vincent de Paul, um, which has been really great to have someone on our board who's familiar with the need um, and has kind of been in the weeds before. Um, our outreach committee and fundraising committee is Stephanie Whalen and Jennifer Blake. Um, so both of them have been fantastic, especially in the past two weeks, putting in um, tons of effort. And then our treasurer is Natraj Iyer. So he's been awesome with managing our finances. He gives us an update of donations every week. Um, he's been looking into some software that we can use to um, you know, follow up with our donors and communicate with them. Um, so yeah, it's been an awesome team. I don't think I'm, did I, was I missing anyone, Hannah? Uh, Renee is our secretary, Renee Dean. Yes, also secretary and part of the grant uh, coordination team. Okay, great. So I just wanna say, as I conclude uh, my comments, there are people in my life that uh, I have come in contact with as I go down the road of life and I have a title for them and I call them life changers. And what you're doing is changing people's lives. And I cannot applaud you more uh, and thank you for the work that you do for our community. Now, I'm just so uh, Jim, I got to say, I'm so blown away by Zach and Hannah and, you know, and their board. Um, I recognize many of the names and, and they're, they're folks that give and give and, you know, their time and their effort. And, and so it's, it's really super wonderful. Yeah, great. All right. So Zach or Hannah, what's your contact info? How do we get in touch with you? Yeah, so you can visit our website at hopkintonemergencyfund.org. Um, and there you'll see um, all, you know, our statements of support um, from our referral organizations. You'll see more information about who we are, our mission and vision. Um, and also on that page, you can donate. We have a PayPal set up um, and you can also write checks to Hopkinton Emergency Fund um, at 27 Hawthorne Street in North Grafton, Mass. Um, so okay. either one of those methods. <laughs> Perfect. We've got to leave it there. Thank you so much. I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks so awesome. much for having Thanks, us. Thanks, Tim. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.